Imagine an 83-year-old woman has an infection that's slowly degenerating her lower jaw structure to the point where continued breathing and speech is on the verge of being lost. Now, there is no procedure where someone can transplant a jaw for obvious reasons. I mean, no one has the same two jaw. So, the solution engineers came up with to solve this problem with a degenerative jaw was to actually design and build a completely new titanium composite jaw, patient-specific. This jaw would completely replace and restore function of the pre-existing structure. This would be surgically implanted right directly after the infected jaw is removed. The surprising thing about this, while well, you might think, is the fact that it's another jaw. It's actually that the day after the surgery took place, the patient had full mobility and speech without restriction. So, hopefully with that story, I've got your attention and you're wondering what I'm going to talk about. That would be 3D printing, or what's otherwise known as additive manufacturing. This is a process in which objects such as that are created by fusing in high temperatures two-dimensional thin slices to create a three-dimensional object. Now, this is in no way a new technology at all. I mean, many people would consider this a new innovative thing, but in all honesty, I was born in 1996, when by then the first printing companies were starting their now modern rise to fame and fortune. So, these machines have been around for the longest time, it's just that no one has known about them, because they've been in industrial application and in high technology sectors. Places like research and development labs, as computers did in the age of mainframes. The only capable operators of these machines were technicians and programmers at university and high levels of technology. These machines started the exact same way, where the only operators were technicians and high technology sectors. But in the same way the computer has been shrink into the laptop, where almost everyone has one nowadays. My smartphone is more powerful than the largest mainframe computer when they first came out. It's the same thing with this machine. They came out with enormous facilities for these, and then shrunk down to the point where I have one in my bedroom, and I can make whatever I want with it on the laptop. So these machines did follow the technological growth trend of the computer from mainframe level to consumer and household use. I must say that a good portion of the groundwork for all of the science and technology that I'm about to explain can be attributed to the book Fabricated, A New World of 3D Printing by Utlips and Anna Kerman. So, 3D printing. What exactly is it? I mean, I've been staying this term for the past few minutes, but what is 3D printing? This brings up images of bionic implants, new body parts and organs. So the men of the future will have titanium bones and super tenseness. But I'm going to tell you what it actually is and what we use it for and where it can be applied. I'm going to attempt to explain this vast world of technologies today, but I'm going to do so only for the most advanced, industrially applicable, and useful of these technologies and machines. So there are two main forms of printing. The first is known as selective deposition. This form is when printers extrude or spray thermoplastic material onto the surface successively to build parts. This is much cheaper and much more effective in the consumer world. The second form is known as selective binding. This form of technology uses high-powered lasers and jets to fuse particulate matter into a solid state in very, very large environments. This is more, the more industrially applicable and stronger, more expensive, useful type of machinery. This is restricted still to industrial applications like aerospace and military. So I'm an engineer. This is what I like to do, and I'm sure if you're like me, by now you really want to find out how they work. So that's exactly what we're going to start to do. I'm going to start deconstructing the different forms and types of printers today. 
So the first form, as I mentioned earlier, selective deposition. It is the kind of printer I have with me today. Each one of these is a selective deposition printer, but more accurately, it can be called an FDM printer or selective binding machine. FDM stands for Fused Deposition Modeling. It is the technical term for these machines. So every one of these things uses fused deposition to create the parts in that filament is loaded in and mounted onto the platform. So I have a video here by Solid Concepts Engineering showcasing fused deposition modeling. Fused Deposition Modeling, or FDM, is a layer additive manufacturing process that uses production grade thermoplastic materials to produce both prototype and end use parts. This technology is known to accurately produce feature details and has an excellent strength to weight ratio. FDM is ideal for concept models, functional prototypes, manufacturing aids, and low volume end use parts. The FDM process begins by slicing 3D CAD data into layers. The data is then transferred to a machine, which constructs the part layer by layer upon a build platform. Thin thread-like spools of thermoplastic and support material are used to create each cross-section of the part. Similar to a hot melt glue gun, uncoiled material is slowly extruded through dual heated nozzles. The extrusion nozzles precisely lay down both support and thermoplastic material upon the preceding layers. FDM is utilized in a number of industries, including aerospace, automotive, industrial, commercial, and medical. Metal laser sintering, also known as DMLS, is an additive manufacturing technology that creates metal parts directly from 3D CAD data without the need for tooling. DMLS utilizes a variety of metal and alloy materials such as stainless steel, cobalt chrome, 
and Inconel to create strong, durable parts and prototypes. DMLS is an excellent choice for functional metal prototypes, high temperature applications, and end use parts. The DMLS process begins in the same fashion as other layer additive manufacturing technologies. A program takes 3D CAD data and mathematically slices it into 2D cross sections. Each of these sections will act as a blueprint telling the DMLS machine exactly where to center the metal material. The data is then transferred to the DMLS equipment. A recoder assembly pushes powdered metal material from the powder supply to create a uniform layer over the base plate. A laser then draws a 2D cross section on the surface of the build material, heating and fusing the material. Once a single layer is complete, the base plate is lowered just enough to make room for the next layer. More material is raised from the cartridge and recoded evenly upon the previously centered layer. The DMLS machine continues to center layer upon layer, building from the bottom up. As the part is built, support structures are added to give supplemental strength to fine features and overhanging surfaces. The completed part is then removed from the base plate and treated with an age-hardening heat process to further harden the part. Any support structures are also removed at this time. With numerous surface treatment and hand polishing options available through service providers such as Solid Concepts, DMLS parts can be used in highly cosmetic applications. Typical uses for DMLS include tools and manufacturing aids, small integrated structures, dental components, surgical implants, and aerospace parts. new industrial tools that they're just so fantastic and everyone wants one. 
But this media bubble has kind of been overplayed by the many hundred companies that have sprung up that are now million dollar companies wanting to sell them to you. There is actually not much of a reason for the average person to have one in their home. I mean, what is it you're going to do with a thousand dollar machine all day? You gotta go to work. So, these machines may or may not be in every household. They may be in a few, they're going to be in mine. But they're most likely to be in a convenience store or Home Depot or something like that, where you'd go in, you want a spare car part or something like that, and they'd give it to you. And that's how I personally see the machines evolving. So, in the words of a Canadian philosopher, damn, I can't really remember right now, we shape our tools, and shortly thereafter, our tools shape us. Thank you.